All right, welcome everyone. Um, we may still have some folks joining, but we want to get started uh, since it's at four. Um, this is the How to Work with FSA webinar, um, which is being put on by the Farmers of Color Network and the Resources for Resilient Farms project. So uh, before we get into conversation, just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, this is a Zoom meeting, so uh, folks have the ability to unmute, but I ask that you keep yourself on mute for the whole webinar just to keep the audio clear. Um, there'll be some time at the end for Q&A. Um, so if you have any, um, if you wanna come off mute at that point, ask a question, you're, you're very welcome to do that. So we are recording this webinar um, and it will be shared with everyone afterwards, um, hopefully tomorrow um, or later this week. We'll have uh, you know, a number of people on the call today, so we won't do individual introductions, but feel free to use the chat box um, just to introduce yourself, your name, where you're calling from, um, maybe a little bit about what you produce, just so we can get a sense of, of who's here. And if you think of any questions as we go through the webinar, please feel free to add them to the chat box um, and we'll save them for the Q&A breaks um, just so we can make sure we're addressing all questions. All right, and kind of an overview of our agenda today. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, talking about farm service agencies, kind of the basics of history, function, structure, um, you know, how to, what to do before, during, and after a meeting to establish working relationship and um, some best practices for addressing issues that, uh, that could come up um, with service provided. And then in the second half of the webinar, we're gonna have um, two farmers joining us who will be sharing their experiences working with FSA offices, how they've built good working relationships um, and how they've navigated um, addressing um, challenges or issues that have come up. All right, first, who's on the call from RAF USA? Um, my name is Lisa Mish. I'm the Director of Outreach and Technical Assistance, um, and I'll be presenting on the first half of our conversation this afternoon. We also have Nikki Presley, who's the Farmers at Color Network Program Coordinator, who will be moderating our farmer panel, and Sabine Freed Bernards, who's Farmers at Color Network Grants Coordinator, who is moderating the chat, and also the person to reach out to if you're having any technical issues. All right, so I wanted to do a quick overview of the resources for Resilient Farms project. Um, that's the um, where this webinar is coming from through this project. Um, it's funded through a cooperative agreement with FSA, um, Farm Service Agency. And the focus of this project is to offer um, technical assistance, one-on-one -on -one support um, and educational outreach around um, specifically disaster assistance programs available with FSA. Um, and really focusing on BIPOC producers in the Southeast region. So our goal is to um, make sure farmers are aware of the different programs, help determine if certain programs are a, a good fit for their situation, um, and then to help access them either through applications or working with offices. And we have an email, you can reach out to us um, by that email for um, assistance, we have a phone number as well as an intake form. And I'll throw, um, we'll throw the link into the chat of our main resources for Resilient Farm Project um, webpage, which includes a lot of educational resources and recordings to past events um, in that inquiry form that I mentioned. And as a, a disclaimer for this webinar today, um, you know, this is meant to be sort of a general overview of how to work with FSA. Um, as this is funded through a FSA cooperative agreement, we're focusing on farm service agency offices as opposed to um, NRCS or soil and water. Um, and we're not trying to do a thorough overview of all the loans and programs that FSA has to offer. That would take quite a long call, um, but we're really focusing in on the process of working with FSA um, and, and, and navigating those offices. Um, through the registration forms, it looks like you know, we have quite a diversity of some people that have never worked with FSA um, before, um, maybe are just starting out. And so starting that relationship um, and some that have great relationships with the office. So quite a, a collection of folks on the call, um, also in terms of commodities and, um, and scale. 
Okay, so I did want to say, you know, our goal for this webinar today is that for everyone to feel confident and ready to take advantage of what FSA has to offer um, farmers. And there are a lot of different loan programs um, and other programs that are available that can help um, increase the capacity of farms. Um, but we also know that some farmers are rightly apprehensive or skeptical or just don't trust working with FSA. Um, so I did want to, you know, have an acknowledgement that, um, you know, USDA does have a long and well-documented history of racial discrimination, particularly for Black farmers, that has resulted in them being squeezed out of access um, to credit or programs or out of farming altogether. Um, this discrimination also extends to gender and um, you know, not recognizing the needs of small and mid-scale producers. Um, and through Rathi's own farm advocacy work, we know that this discrimination still happens in offices. With that being said, um, we have an administration that has expressed a strong desire um, to make sure that farmers of color and other underserved groups um, are receiving adequate support and that any discrimination is being addressed head on. Um, and we've seen some action already through the creation of an equity commission um, and through devoting dollars to cooperative agreement projects like this where our, they're putting money towards organizations that have connections with um, these underserved groups that they've identified to make sure that they are, um, they're reaching all the groups that they um, want to be reaching. So our goal today is to break down how any farmer can work with FSA, again, depending on whether you're starting off from scratch or have had interactions in the past, um, and that you feel confident and motivated to start building that relationship and accessing resources. Um, and we also want to make sure that farmers know their rights um, and know what FSA's responsibilities are to them, the farmers they serve. So what is Farm Service Agency? Um, it is an agency within USDA that has evolved in name and function widely throughout the years, but traces its beginnings back to the 1930s during the Great Depression through the Resettlement Administration, helping farmers um, affected by the Dust Bowl. Um, it's morphed into Farm Security Administration, Farmers Home Administration. Um, in 1994, we see you know, the name Farm Service Agency established um, and it encompassed previous programs like the Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service, Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, and Farmers Home Administration. Um, and as of today, FSA's responsibilities um, are there's four bullets there. I bolded the first two because those are the ones that are most pertinent to farmers usually, which is farm programs. Talk a little bit about that, but include things like conservation, disaster relief. Um, then there's farm loan programs, um, providing credit to expand, start, maintain family farms. Um, that comes in a couple different categories. Um, and then other responsibilities include commodity operations and, and management and state operations. I wanted to include this organizational chart of USDA just to give you a sense of you know, where does FSA fit within the whole agency? Because USDA is a big agency, it administers SNAP, it does a bunch of research. Um, but I can, you can see I circled it down in the bottom left. It exists under that function of farm production and conservation. Um, and it's grouped with maybe other um, offices that you're familiar with, like the National Resources and Conservation Service and Risk Management Agency. Um, so that's, that's where Farm Service Agency sits. And then within Farm Service Agency, um, it has the advantage of having um, representation on multiple geographic scales. So um, you have the, the county office, and those are the folks that are in the field, able to work directly with farmers, um, administering programs, and there's lots of decision-making that happens at this level. Um, and this is a level that most farmers are interacting with um, FSA. Then every state also has a state office um, where you know, it performs a variety of functions, but they can set state-specific rules or rates or thresh thresholds that pertain to programs. Um, they may be requesting particular funding sources from the national office, um, and, and there are also program experts at the state level for different things like you know, loans or a NAP program specialist. 
Um, and then you also have your FSA national office, which can set nationwide rules and, and race and thresholds and um, is a final decision maker for um, many programs and can deliver nationwide guidance and directives. All right, so why would farmers wanna work with FSA and what does it have to offer? I am gonna hit on those kind of two bullets in that previous slide of farm loan programs and farm programs. Um, and I'll, I'll emphasize that within FSA, um, there is kind of delineation between those two groups. So if you're talking to someone on the farm program side, they might not be able to answer your questions on the farm loan side. Uh, so knowing who you're talking to within FSA is, is really helpful. Um, so just thinking on the, on the farm loan side, you know, this is financing to start, expand, or maintain a family farm. Um, and FSA provides these loans um, because it's the goal of helping farmers obtain loans at reasonable rates, um, either through USDA directly um, being the lender um, or through a guaranteed loan where you're working with a USDA approved lender. Um, and there's a couple different loans that farmers can look at. Um, you know, ownership, that would be your longer term um, loan to maybe purchase farmland. Um, operating, that would be annual or short term to do um, production. Um, and then there's some other categories like micro loans are you know, especially good for beginning farmers um, to obtain lending at reasonable rates. Then we have um, you know, other programs and just listed some of them here as kind of starting points, but there's a selection of disaster assistance programs for farmers that have experienced some sort of major loss event or natural disaster. Um, so something like you know, livestock indemnity program. Um, if you are a, a livestock producer and experience um, you know, mortality rates greater than would be expected because of some sort of loss event, this program would um, could provide some payments for that loss and compensate that loss. Um, and non-insured crop disaster assistance program, which is commonly um, referred to as NAP, similar, um, you know, if you experience sort of crop failure above what would be expected due to a loss, um, loss event, you can provide some sort of payments for that. And we did do an in-depth webinar around NAP a little earlier this year. So if you are curious about that, we'll throw the link um, to that recording in the chat if you wanna check that out. FSA also has a number of conservation programs. Um, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program is one of the, um, the major ones um, where you're, they're providing farmers a yearly rent payment for removing environmentally sensitive lands um, off of agricultural production. Um, and there's also one that's specifically around grasslands. So that's something you could ask FSA about. Um, or the Emergency Conservation Program is helping um, pay for the expense of rehabilitating land that was damaged due to a disaster. So it's back into agricultural production. Other programs like organic certification cost share to help shoulder some of the expense of getting um, certified organic dairy margin um, coverage, market facilitation. Um, again, it's not our goal to go over um, you know, any of these programs in too great of depth. Um, it's just to give a sense of what programs might be interesting and um, kind of be a starting point for conversation if you go into a local office. Beyond the farm loans and farm programs, some other incentives, reasons to be engaged with FSA um, is so that you receive ongoing newsletters um, about latest programs that are available. Um, they may send out, you know, this new program started, this deadline's coming up, so just being in the know is um, really helpful and that's Newsletters are one of the main and only ways that FSA is able to, to really communicate directly with producers. So it's helpful to get those. Um, also, it's an opportunity to vote or be elected within FSA county committees. Um, so FSA county committees are an important part of the administration of FSA programs. Um, and it's on the local level, includes farmers that are within that county. Um, and it includes decision-making around producer appeals, conservation programs, um, disaster payments. Um, so another important place of, of governance that um, you can either elect someone into or potentially participate in when you are um, engaged with your FSA office. Okay, some of you may be very familiar with your FSA, where your FSA service center is, um, but for anyone that isn't as sure, 
um, there's a link on the slide and, and maybe we'll also put it in the chat to where you can find exactly where your FSA service center is um, in your county. So if you go and you know, click on your state, you can then click on the list of your county um, and it'll take you to um, this, this list here. This is where Rappi's office is located in Chatham County. Um, and I can see that you know, the Pitts Rail Service Center is located at this address. I can contact them this phone number. And um, this office includes the Farm Service Agency, the NRCS office, and the Conservation District. So kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of different um, offices. In some counties, they may be in several different um, locations. Some of them, are they, they tend to try to group them together. Um, and then I can see that there's also a rural, de rural development office not in Chatham County, but in a, in a nearby um, location. Okay, so basics of how to start working with your FSA office. If you, um, you know, are wanting to start the conversation, where do you start? Um, and sort of the, the next few slides, the one, two, three steps, um, this comes from a resource that um, USDA has put out for beginning farmers. And this is, you know, the exact advice that they provide for how to set up meetings and um, you know what to do after for follow-up. Um, so first is making an appointment. Um, once you locate your service center, you can either call or email to schedule an appointment. Um, you know, there were some specific COVID um, directives earlier of you know not being able to do in person. And you know, I think a lot of offices are now doing in person, but it may vary from location. So you can ask about that. Um, and you don't need to say, you know, I want to go in and talk about this specific program in order to, to, to set up an appointment. You know, it can be generally asking, I want to learn more about what programs might apply to my, to my farm operation and what can support me. Um, and that can be a starting point. Um, maybe one thing to mention is that if you are hoping to specifically talk about farm loans, um, oftentimes there is a loan officer that is serving multiple counties. And so it can be the harder just to find times to meet with them. So don't, maybe not expect that to be an immediate turnaround or meeting with them the next day, but they might have to, um, you know, find a, a time that works well for their schedule. Um, as you're making that appointment, thinking about preparing for the visit. So depending on what you want to talk about, maybe ask the, the staff member if there's any documents that you can be preparing ahead, ahead of time to make the most of your meeting together. Um, so if you're thinking about a farm number, that could be putting together your um, deed or lease agreement, um, identification. If you're thinking more about um, you know, loans, that could be making sure you have a schedule F or insurance guarantees with you when you go into the office. Um, and lastly, um, be thinking about your goals and your vision and be ready to explain you know, what, what you're hoping for your farm. And that can help um, the FSA agent also think about what programs might be a, a good fit. Okay, and then during your visit, um, if you don't already have a farm number, uh, registering for a farm number would be an excellent thing to make sure you get done in your um, initial visit. Um, and this is a, it's a number that identifies the farm. It's not for the farmer, it's for the, the farm land. Um, and it's required to participate in many USDA programs. So it's kind of your, your entry step for um, a lot of eligibility. Um, if you don't have a farm number, we have a blog post on our website of how and why to get a farm number. Um, so I suggest taking a look at that. Um, in addition to that, discussing business goals, like I mentioned, um, there might be more kind of questions about your production, um, timing, markets, so they can get a sense of what might be um, applicable for your business. Um, you may expect to also review other standard forms that are um, you know, often required for USDA program participation. Um, I mentioned 80, 10, 26, and CCC 941 here, um, which that applies to conservation compliance and adjusted gross income verification. So there's, there's usually, you know, a collection of some forms that, you know, you just need to get done kind of on the, the front end, and that will make doing business with USDA um, easier as you go along. You kind of have that baseline. And lastly, during your visit, you just want to make sure that you've signed up to receive any updates um, that FSA would be putting out about sign up deadlines, things like that. And after your visit, so I want to talk a little bit about receipt for service. Um, a receipt for service is a document that summarizes 
uh, who you talked to when you visited, um, what, when you talked to them, an overview of what sort of services um, you requested to talk about and what action was taken or recommended by the FSA agent. And it's something, it's in a document that is applies to any, um, any in-person visit, any phone call, any email. It has to do with communication with the FSA office. Um, prior to the 2014 Farm Bill, uh, FSA was required to give farmers a receipt for service anytime the farmer requested it. After the 2014 bill, for 2014 Farm Bill, the policy changed and FSA is required to give a receipt for service regardless of whether the farmer requests it. From what we hear from farmers, you know, some offices are in the habit of providing receipt for service each time, some are not. Um, so after your, your visit, especially if you're just starting out, make sure you ask for a receipt for service. Um, the first advantage of this is that you're creating a documentation of what FSA has advised for you. Um, and you can you know, go back and reference things. While we wouldn't want, you know, we wouldn't want there to be an adversarial sort of relationship with FSA, the other advantage of having receipts for services is you have the documentation of what FSA has advised you um, if you need to go back and make a case for something. Um, but asking for those receipts for services early in your relationship is re recommended. Um, also after your visit, filing acreage reports. Um, so this may, might seem kind of strange of, you know, why do I need to tell USDA when I'm planting and where and, um, and, and how often I'm doing it. Um, but acreage reports are another good way to remain eligible for different USDA programs. Um, and when, when FSA knows that you have a certain thing in production and there is a program that comes online that would apply, they can let you know. Um, so this sometimes is useful for different disaster relief programs um, or let's see, this last year or the year before this pandemic cover crop um, program came up um, that provided payments to farmers that were doing cover crops. And you know, if someone had an acreage report on file that they were doing cover crops, FSA knew to um, let them know directly that there, there was this program for them. Um, so that's that's another good way just to kind of remain eligible for potential programs. Um, third, just staying in touch with FSA offices are good um, if you have any business changes or you experience a disaster. Um, one reason for that is that many of the disaster assistance programs require farmers to file some sort of notice of loss with the office um, within a certain timeline. Um, sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's three days. Um, so just letting an FSA office know like, you know, I, I lost, I had this big crop failure or I had, um, you know, grazing land that was damaged. Um, that can be helpful um, for different eligibility and just so the county office has a sense of impact and how farmers are doing um, in the fields. And lastly, setting up an online account um, so farmers can create their own account through farmers.gov. And that just is another way for them to manage their business with FSA um, online, like submitting documents or signing things. And so that can um, create a greater ease with working with FSA. Okay, so that was all like the kind of, you know, the best practices, the recommendations of how things will go. Um, but sometimes reality is more complicated than that. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about you know, what we sometimes hear from farmers on the ground of interactions with FSA where it doesn't feel like things are going by that ideal of the one, two, three step. Um, so we've heard from farmers that, you know, sometimes they'll go into the office and they feel like they got the brush off. Um, you know, either the, the loan officer didn't have time for them or, um, you know, they said they didn't have anything, they didn't have any programs for them. Um, and sometimes farmers feel like that's related to their race or their age or gender or their farming size. Um, similarly, sometimes farmer FSA agents don't inform farmers of a particular program um, that, that could in fact be useful for that farmer. Um, some farmers report long delays in servicing and communication um, and needing to follow up. Um, 
And there's also the reality that a lot of FSC offices are understaffed and are experiencing major workforce transitions of people retiring and new staff coming on and they're just being trained in process. So there being some um, you know, communication breakdowns or um, uh, some difficulties around that. And then also wanted to acknowledge that there's power dynamics um, in play when we go to FSA offices. Um, I'd say agents hold a lot of information and power, and that can cause <laughs> that can cause stress when you're working with someone that has the ability to make a decision that can affect your um, your operation and, and the success of it. So um, that's that's a reality that we deal with. So then thinking about best practices for farmers that want to work with FSA, um, I want to leave most of the space for our farmer panelists to talk about this, but First step is you know, always trying to build that positive relationship with the office. So if there are issues that come up, if there are communication breakdowns, you have a base to kind of to work through things and, and try to come to an agreement. If that doesn't seem to be working, um, or if you feel like you're not getting adequate assistance, there is also um, you know, other steps you could look at taking. Um, first would be if you wanted to check in with like a third party or if you're, um, if you're a, like a BIPOC producer in the Southeast, you can check in with Rafi. Um, like to get a second opinion, um, you know, maybe you come out of an office and you think like, I don't know if I quite understood that, or maybe I'm missing some context. Um, just talking with like another farmer or farmers serving um, NCT to get another perspective can be helpful. Um, or even asking someone to go to uh, in-person meeting with you just to be a second pair of ears or take notes while you're listening. Um, there's also reconsideration in mediation processes for certain um, USDA programs. Uh, so if you receive an adverse decision and feel like you shouldn't have, um, you have the right to request a reconsideration with the decision maker um, and see if they will reconsider um, their decision. And then finally, there's appeals and civil rights complaints. Um, so if you feel like you were unfairly denied for something or were intentionally uninformed or misled by an FSA office, um, you can go through an appeals process. Um, one thing I'll note about that is that that can take that can take months to get through the whole process. So depending on what you're trying to appeal, it could push you past some important planting dates. Um, so time is a consideration there. Um, civil rights complaints are another thing that often take a lot of time um, to go through the whole process. Um, and have, we have heard from some farmers that, you know, they didn't quite get the satisfaction that they were hoping for from that process to start with. Um, but know that it is an option um, for, for you to pursue if you feel like um, you've been unfairly denied. And lastly, I'll throw in Rafi's farmer crisis hotline at the bottom, um, which is open Monday through Fridays, nine to six. Uh, call us if you've received an adverse decision from an agency, if you feel like unfairly, um, if you're dealing with some sort of loss or disaster, going to mediation or need assistance negotiating with lenders. Um, I also want you to know that that's a resource. Okay, I think bef that's the end of the first part. And before we go into the farmer panel, I wanted to stop if there was any um, questions that came up during the first section. Folks can feel free to come off mute. I also have some of the questions that were in the chat, but um, if anyone wants to ask a question with their voice, we'll give a second for that. Can people go with any questions in the chat? Yeah, there was a question about the value added producer grant. Um, <laughs> Just in general, the value added? Um, sorry, the value added producer grant and about that program. And so with any specific programs, we can send some links to follow up. I know Lisa just did um, a webinar recently about that. So we won't go over all the specifics of those small ones, but I noted any of the, um, and then someone had a question about form updating. So we'll email those out, um, the answers to those out with like a follow-up email. Um, Someone is asking also about how to sign up for newsletters. That's a, another thing we can share. Um, 
So I think we can do the panel and if people have questions after that. Awesome. Um, and was that the, like a, the Rafi newsletter or FSA newsletter? I think the FSA newsletter, oh, yeah. Correct, great. Um, great, well then I will pass it over to Nikki um, for our farmer panel. Thanks, Lisa. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so this last bit of our webinar, we wanted to <clears throat> spend some time talking to a couple of farmers and getting their experiences working with FSA. Um, and as Lisa alluded to, experiences var uh, vary from farmer to farmer. Um, so we want to recognize and thank these two farmers for taking time out of their busy farm schedules or busy days to, um, to share with us about their experience. Um, they'll be sharing some challenges, some successes, and any, any insights they might have to, um, to share with, with fellow farmers here on the call. Um, we have with us today um, Anita Roberson, who's a farmer at Botanical Bites and Provisions in Virginia. And also um, farming in Virginia, we have Chardel Gerald um, with Rethinking the Leaf. Um, and so we'll start with both of you. If you'll just kind of um, give us a, a brief background of you know your farm, what you're what you're growing, how long you've been growing, just sort of how you got into farming, um, and then we'll start there. Anita, we'll start with you if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. I'm happy to be here today. I'm located in Spotsylvania, Virginia. And I farm along with my husband and we've been farming now for about nine years. We grow um, primarily fruits and vegetables, cut flowers, and we also raise honeybees. We have three high tunnels. Our farm is about 10 acres and we grow without pesticides, herbicides, or any kind of preservatives. And we're certified naturally grown. Um, we love what we do. We also have a value added component. Um, I was a recipient of a rural development value added producer grant, and I'm in my final year of that grant program. So um, what I do is I take, I'm also a beekeeper. So I take the honey and beeswax and I make natural cosmetics. And um, I'd make things like lip balms, soaps, lotions, and uh, salves. So that's pretty much my background. I um, was in the military, so and then left the military to work in the federal government in Washington D.C. Retired and became a farmer. I am a fourth generation farmer, but I didn't grow up on a farm. Uh, went through a lot of training through uh, Virginia State's um, small farm outreach program. And I'm sure they have similar programs in your county with extension officers and uh, learned how to, you know, farm the contemporary way and really enjoying what I do. So that's pretty much who I am. Thank you. Shardell? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shardell Gerald, and I'm the owner of Rethinking the Leaf Corporation. And I came to farming by way of my family having been in the farming industry for generations. And I grew up on the family farm in North Carolina. However, I did not pursue agriculture as a career um, until recently when the 2018 Farm Bill was passed in hemp as a domestic uh, crop was uh, permitted or uh, legalized uh, for commercial growth. And so in 2019, we, myself and my partner and family members who have been involved in farming, uh, pursued the opportunity to uh, farm. And we were looking initially at operating our farm in North Carolina, which is where our uh, land um, existed in Robinson County, but we ran into some challenges with being able to obtain the registration to grow hemp in North Carolina due to how they had set up their agricultural uh, hemp program. And so I explored Virginia because that is where I lived. And I was living in urban uh, Virginia in New the city of Newport News. So I really didn't think I had a chance at being able to grow an agricultural crop in my backyard and I applied just to see what would happen and Virginia actually was very open 
to looking at embracing new opportunities in urban communities for farmers um, to explore what the opportunities were in the industrial hemp industry. And I was granted a registration. And so in 2019, we actually grew a first hemp crop in um, my backyard. And as a result of the 2019 um, domestic hemp program interim rule, we were advised that we had to report our acreage to the FSA office, thus my introduction to FSA. And I'll wait and, and go further into that as we get into the additional questions. But that's my background. I am by profession, a trained profession, a social worker interested in helping people. And so that's my interest in the cannabis hemp industry. Thank you both. Um, you kind of uh, segued into my first question, which is um, for both of you, um, what was your initial understanding and impressions of FSA before you started working with them? And then um, sort of what prompted you to begin a relationship with, with FSA and, and how did that uh, relationship initially start off? Well, my whoever wants to jump in first, it's fine. Okay. My foray into working with FSA started um, as a new and beginning farmer. As I took um, programs with the Small Farm Outreach Program at Virginia State University, um, they made it clear that we needed to have a farm number in order to get certain benefits that USDA had to offer. And they directed us to go to our FSA office to start with that. And from there, you know, I learned a lot about the different opportunities that FSA had. Uh, one of the things that I like to do every time I go into one of the offices is to pick up little brochures that I can share with other new and beginning farmers um, that generally have sort of like uh, Lisa had mentioned in her presentation, you know, the steps that you need to take to start working with them. And that farm number is so important to um, getting benefits that USDA has to offer. As a beekeeper, they also have insurance um, under the ELAP program. And I'm sorry, I don't know what ELAP um, stands for, what the acronym stands for, but it's similar to the NAP insurance. And as a new and beginning farmer, these insurance programs are free. Otherwise, you know, that would be additional expenses out of your pocket, your operating budget. Um, the other thing that I love is receiving the newsletters and going, you know, to my email box to understand, you know, when different programs that have the benefits that I look for, the ELAP, the NAP are due and, you know, the reporting requirements. Um, it's very important that you engage with your county committee because they have impacts on a lot of the federal assistance grants that come into your county and decide sometimes who gets high tunnels and who doesn't. And um, as a new and beginning farmer, after my second year of farming, I decided I was going to run for the county committee. One thing that a lot of BIPOC uh, farmers don't realize, these people are getting paid and, you know, they serve, but they're also paid servants. So you need to be involved in those elections and you need to run for those positions. Um, you can also sign up for text alerts. For a lot of farmers, that's really beneficial because you don't have time, oftentimes, you know, when it's crop season like it is now, to go to your computer and find out, well, what's the latest information that's coming out of the FSA office? And I agree, you know, asking for those receipts for service um, helps prevent miscommunications because you think you may have said one thing and then the FSA agent has heard something totally different. Um, and the other thing is um, I'm in my ninth year of farming so I've seen changes in the FSA office. I've seen, you know, with elections, new administrators come in, um, the office changes oftentimes with the politics in our nation. So, you know, it's important to get those receipts for service to make sure that 
what you're requesting is um, honored. And then when you call them, you have a record of how long it took to get that response. And if you don't get a response from sometimes um, from people, sometimes it's because, you know, they're busy just like everybody else. And, you know, sometimes emails go to the bottom. So it's important for you to follow up. Don't always say, you know, I asked them and um, I got nothing in return. And then all these deadlines pass. So I recommend that you be proactive on your part as well. And if you don't get a response, they have a boss. And, you know, we need to understand as farmers that we're paying these people salaries. So we can contact their boss and make sure that they do their work. Thank you, Anita. Mm -hmm. um, Shardell, same question. Just um, what were your initial impressions and understanding of FSA before you started working with them? So I, I honestly didn't have any idea uh, what their role and responsibilities were until I had to reach out to them to understand what my responsibility was to file the acreage report. And in filing that acreage report, um, I learned more about what was required because they sent me a slew of paperwork um, that they needed in order to be able to better support and serve me. So they asked me questions about what I was doing, how long I was doing it. Um, they wanted to know how I registered and they actually scheduled an appointment to come out uh, and do a site visit and linked me to NCRS or NRCS. Um, and in that way, I became uh, clearer about what their role and responsibilities were and how they could assist me. But it was by me asking questions about their role and responsibilities as well that helped me to better understand what programs and services they had to offer. And, and so it was a mutual exchange, me not knowing anything and then having to ask questions that actually brought me to a place where I had a better understanding of what they were able to do. But for me, because the hemp program, the domestic program was still in a pilot phase in 2019, I was initially told that there was not much the FSA was going to be able to offer in terms of support because it was, it was still a pilot program. And so because my focus was specifically on the hemp product, the hemp crop, um, there was some limitation initially in my understanding about what they could offer. But I kept the agent's names um, readily available. And so when the opportunity uh, presented itself, I actually reached back out to those individuals who came to my home and asked additional questions um, once the USDA had the final rule and it was no longer a pilot project. And that's how I started my process of my long-term engagement, which has been now um, a little over a year with the FSA office and applying for uh, the programs that they have available, particularly the farm ownership loan program. Thank you. Um, connected to that, just um, just wondering how both of you approach um, going to your FSA office, and especially now that you you sort of gotten over that initial relationship um, hurdle of the, the meeting, and sort of now you know your your agents a little better. Um, <clears throat> are you still constantly um, preparing uh, for those meetings with doing research, um, talking to other farmers, preparing documents? I'm just trying to get an idea of sort of how you. How are you approaching each meeting with your FSA agent? For me, so, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to say, for me, I literally have never gone to the FSA office. And I've had contact with four over the last year and a half because of um, the particular situation that I'm in, where I had to ask lots of questions. I started with one FSA office. And because I've now transitioned to a new county, which initially I didn't know where I was going to wind up. I contacted the county where I thought I was going to purchase land and 
contacted their FSA office and got one set of responses. And then when that didn't pan out and I found that there was another property in another county, I wound up contacting a different FSA office. And this is all telephone contact, me just picking up the phone and asking to speak to a representative in the FSA office under the farm loan program specifically, because that's what I was interested in. And I kept getting different responses um, that led me to do my own research and then call back and have to ask some specific questions about the program's design. Um, and I also reached back out to the folks that came to my home initially and said, hey, listen, I'm getting different information from different people. And then I'm also reading some information that's available out on the web. And so help me understand and navigate how best uh, to proceed. And I wind up calling um, the office back and saying, hey, I, you know, this is what you told me when we last spoke. And I didn't even know about the receipt of services. Now that I know about that, I will be asking for a receipt of services. Um, but they, the individuals that I spoke to never denied what they said. They actually said, well, you know, that is true. When I brought up some things I had saw on the USDA website that they had not shared about the process of eligibility. And she said, well, I don't really know that, you know, you could do that because this is the way it's structured. And I was like, okay, so I went to somebody else. So I just kept going to individuals to see how much I could learn um, from them because different people, what I've learned in this process, know different things and they're at different levels. And it may be because of staff turnover, they could be new to their position um, or it could be a matter of their interpretation. But I literally have not had to visit a office um, personally in, in person. All of my contact has been um, by phone and by email as a follow-up. I did in fact though request um, two site visits to the property that I did wind up purchasing uh, from the FSA office. But again, it was related to the NRCS work, the soil conservation, uh, HEL and the wetland determination, but they were responsive. Um, they came out, they met with me, um, they answered all the questions that I had, they spent, they spent a good deal of time. And when you talked about not agreeing with the determination or feedback that you received, I actually had that experience and I questioned a determination on the property that I was able to purchase and the staff met me out on the property and literally walked through how they came to their determination so that I could better understand and be in alignment and agreement with their decision and understood how that decision impacted my ability to move forward with the with the farm plan. So I, I think it's just a, a it, it'll be situational, um, but I try to prepare my questions in advance so that when I finish talking to whoever I'm talking to, I know what I'm walking away with. I've learned um, not to make any assumptions. And I um, would echo what she says. I recommend that you do as much research as you can online to find out about these programs, um, especially um, like the insurance programs as well as the loan programs. A lot of these people, when I first started going to the FSA office, my agent had um, probably 30, 40 years in that office. So she was really good. She came to my farm um, and you know, made appointments and pretty much held my hand. And later, mid, you know, she retired. So, you know, I've had a lot of new people that aren't as knowledgeable, the girl that's in the office now just started. So, you know, every time you go in, she's got to call Richmond and relay your question. So, you know, be mindful that, you know, new people are going to be starting and not everybody's going to have the knowledge that to explain the programs to you. 
Um, so I, that's why I recommend trying to do some footwork yourself to at least have a foundation when you go in about the program. But don't hesitate to ask them to explain because if they can't explain, they should have supervisors to help you. Thank you. Um, and Shardell, you mentioned you're um, getting a farm loan or applying for a farm loan and I'm wondering what other, what other programs and services um, with FSA specifically um, have, have provided great benefit to your farm operation? So um, right now we're in the process of applying for a, a home uh, financing to put a home on the property. So that's the next, the big step after having obtaining the, uh, the ownership loan. The other areas where FSA is helping is that they have to now um, provide a, a remediation plan for highly erodible um, land determination. And so they're gonna be involved with providing that support um, and making sure that plan is in place and is aligned with the business plan. So. I feel like I have a resource that I can call and, and say, hey, listen, what are what are my next steps to actually putting the business plan um, in action? And I have a list of things that I need to do because I have also applied for the high tunnel. Um, and I was a little taken aback because I thought that um, the high tunnel application had been processed and that in this year, I would be able to benefit from that um, that loan program um, and there was some miscommunication about whether or not the property was prepared or ready. And when he came out and did the site visit uh, back in February, he was like, oh, I thought there was actually a crop here already. And so you've got to put in a year. And so basically after hearing that, I was not necessarily happy because I wasn't under that impression. That wasn't my understanding. And so I just nicely asked for him to list all of the requirements um, for me to have in place so that I knew that I would meet all of the criteria that was necessary to be eligible for the funding to purchase the first high tunnel. And so there are just a, a numerous um, opportunities and programs that you can talk to the FSA about to help you develop um, your, your plan for, for your farm. While I'm starting out with the hemp program, the hemp production program, I do see myself venturing into other areas of, of farming um, to include timberland, leaving some timber on the farm. And so They've just been, like I said, a, a great resource, but you've got to do your homework. You've got to ask your questions. And that um, services, that receipt of services is got to, that's going to be key. I wish I had have known that before today, uh, because that would have been my paper trail for, you know, what people have said and, and what has been done. Um, and definitely be using that strategy moving forward. Thank you. Um, Anita, same thing. I'm wondering what, what programs and services have, have particularly benefited you and your farm. Well, as we all know, farming is such a risk. And my FSA agent was very forthcoming about the NAP program, especially that beginning and uh, limited resource farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers and veterans are eligible for that free NAP insurance. And I think that's something that all new farmers should get because, you know, with climate change, you don't know whether you're going to have rain from year to year. Um, in our area, I think it snowed last week, you know, and, you know, I do have high tunnels, but, you know, in areas where you don't have high tunnels and you have those extreme temperatures, it may affect your crops. So please, everybody that's new and beginning, go out there and get that free NAP insurance. Um, that at least provides you a 50% premium. And it goes the same thing for beekeepers. So that was, those were the two items that, you know, we were very fortunate to uh, have had to help us with our farming operation. Thank you. 
And on the flip side of that, um, could you both uh, talk about um, experiences with FSA where things necessarily didn't go as planned? Um, maybe a challenge came up um, and also how you how you work through that challenge to to sort of continue the, the relationship um, with your office or your particular agent? Well, um, I guess for me, it was the high tunnels. When we first started farming, we were interested in high tunnels. And I know high tunnels come under the EQIP program under the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And, you know, when you're first starting out and they're throwing out all these acronyms and in my instance, my USDA office houses FSA, the Natural Resource Conservation people, the Soil and Water District, they're all there. And when you're new, and you hear all these acronyms, it gets really confusing. So, and, and knowing, you know, who's responsible for what. So, you know, in the same way, I was a little confused why my application was being denied. And so, you know, I went to the FSA office and I went online and did research and found out, you know, there is this county committee that votes, you know, on people getting resources. And so when I found out about that, I started researching the county committee. And I even went as far as finding out their calendar. I'm retired. So I'm, I have a lot of flexibility with my time. So I would sit in their meetings, you know, I wouldn't announce myself, I would be there. So, you know, sometimes as farmers, we have to make bold moves. And, you know, after I started inserting myself in their operations, um, I think I was taken a little bit more seriously about my desire to move my farming operation forward and getting the resources that I needed. So, you know, don't be meek, um, stand up for yourselves. And, you know, if there's an instance where you're still getting that um, backlash, you know, contact resources like RAFI to serve as that intermediary to um, help you be heard. Thank you. Chardell, mm -hmm. same question for you. So one of the challenges that I had with um, FSA was in obtaining the farm ownership loan and going through that process. And so there is a regulation in the USDA rights that states that in order for the Farm Service Agency to accept an application, not even process, accept an application, the person has to have a legal purchase contract, which is very different in the commercial residential um, real estate industry um, in that you get a pre-approval of what you're capable of, what you're approved to, to purchase on the FSA ownership loan side. The FSA office doesn't provide you with a pre-approval, but they require you to have a purchase contract. And when you are um, dealing with real estate professionals, they wanna see a pre-approval letter that you're qualified um, to in, engage in the conversation about purchasing um, the property that you, you're talking about. And, and so to me, it just seemed odd that you would require a purchase contract but not provide a pre-approval letter. And so in reading the regs, I thought that that just didn't make sense. And so I questioned whether the regs were being interpreted and applied correctly. Um, and I spoke to the farm loan manager. He connected me to the Richmond office. I spoke to the individuals at the Richmond office and shared what my concern was and what I had experienced because the realtor that I had uh, engaged was not willing to provide a purchase contract for the land that we had identified because he didn't know me from Adam. And when I had asked the farm loan manager, well, how does this get done? Give me an example. And he said, basically, you have to know someone. You know, it's, um, it's a neighbor selling to a neighbor or a father selling to their son. And to me, that just did not seem 
like there was a fair access to this resource if that is the way in which you obtain uh, a purchase contract, right? Because someone who doesn't know you is not just going to be willing to provide a legal purchase contract, take their property off the market so that you can go through this USDA FSA farm loan review approval that could literally take months depending on you know what level of review is required for that ownership loan. I wound up contacting my local congressional representative because I just did not believe that this could be the correct interpretation and that that should have been an or, not an and and a requirement. Unfortunately, I didn't get to hear what I wanted to hear. Um, when it went up through the review, my congressional representative came back and said, well, no, Shardell, that's what they said is the regulation. And so, of course, I had to live with that decision, but I made it known through the ranks that I did not believe that that was a fair and equitable way for individuals to be able to access that resource. Because if someone wasn't willing to take a chance on you, um, you weren't going to be able to obtain that purchase contract. Thank you. Um, and both of you have hit on this, you know, in your previous comments, but I'm, I'm wanting to, to kind of get some your parting insights on um, advice you have for farmers who um, are nervous about working with FSA, whether it's um, because of the size of their farm, um, you know, what, whatever reason there might be, um, and having in their mind that, that maybe FSA can't help them, can't do anything for them, um, what advice and insights you might you might share with them. And also um, as a part of that, um, is there a way for, for farmers to sort of work together and support each other when it comes to interacting with their FSA office and agents? I believe the FSA office works for us. We are taxpayers, we pay their salaries and they're obligated to provide these services. I believe in standing up for myself. And I think as farmers, you know, we have a long history, especially as Black and other minorities, um, which she explained in her introduction. And we're long overdue, you know, the respect that we deserve as farmers. You can't be timid when you go in these offices. Um, and you can't allow them to get away with bad service, customer service. Um, just like she said, she wrote to her lo local con congressional office for assistance, even though she didn't get the answers she wanted, it was still in writing that, you know, there was this conflict. And if we can show records of repeated, you know, conflicts, we can show a pattern of discrimination and, and change will happen. Um, I believe in, you know, doing my memorandums for record. Um, after I have an engagement with somebody in the office, especially if it's some technical information that I'm seeking, I will sit down and send them an email. This is my understanding of our conversation on this day. I ask you these questions. These were your responses. And then at the end, I'll say things like, um, how long will it take for a response? if it's a, a question or how long will it take to receive these services? So be proactive as farmers because, you know, our time is valuable as well as their time. So, you know, ask for those receipts of service and, and continue to um, advocate for yourselves. I mean, I wholeheartedly concur. I, I think one of the um, strategies that I've used is call and call again and call again. Um, I actually said to one of the FSA officers, you know, this timing has been much longer than I had anticipated. Um, and while I understand that there are lots of things happening and, you know, a lot of moving parts to this process, I feel like I have not been kept informed and I've given a lot of space thinking things are happening when in fact, um, it doesn't seem like anything is happening in the way in which I'm thinking it should happen. 
And so I actually said to one of the FSA officers, I'm going to call you every day now. I, I, so I just want to put you on notice because I don't want to be um, at the bottom of your to-do list because I now have waited um, three months and I thought things were moving along and apparently they haven't been. And so I've been very clear and, and I try not to get frustrated with them, um, but I, I let them know that I'm not going to not call. So expect my call. I want an update when I call on what needs to happen or what's expected to happen. Let me know if there's something that I need to do that you haven't received from me. Because if I'm the holdup, I need to get out of my own way. However, if you're the holdup, then that's a different conversation. And I'd like an explanation as to what the holdup is and what are we going to do differently. Um, so that if there's a need to expedite a process, what does that look like? Because I don't mind asking for an expedited process because there has been miscommunication um, between what I thought was going to happen and what you understood to happen. Uh, so I've just tried to develop relationships and set expectations uh, with the individuals in the various offices. And now I'm working with two different offices. The farm loan is in one office and the FSA services are in a different office. And, and so it's an interesting dynamic and you have to, as Anita said, you have to know who you're talking to and I'm still learning that, right? I'm still learning the integration and the interconnectedness between the various offices and who's responsible for what. And that has been one of my challenges is I'm thinking one person is handling it and what has to be done is has to be done by another office and another official. And so where's the breakdown in that communication? And so I started asking more questions. Well, who's that person? You Give me that person's number because I'll call them myself. I don't have a problem with helping to facilitate the connection. Um, I'm not retired, but I find time for what's important to me. And so we need to get some things done. Let's get the work done. And so that's what's been helpful. Um, and it, again, I think following up with the email or asking them to follow up with an email so that you know where you are in your process. I think that's the one that thing that has been most challenging for me is I think I should be much further along, but I think, you know, I don't want to hound people. And so I think I'm giving grace. And then when I think it should be done, I call and find out nothing has been done. Oh, well, we're past that time frame now. I call as much as I need to. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I wanted to leave space for if anyone um, wanted to ask any questions directly to Anita or Shardell. Feel free to drop it in the chat or you can come off mute. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you both can see the chat, but you've already gotten some kudos and appreciation there for just your time and your insights. Sabine, were there any other questions in the in the chat from earlier that? Not that have come in. Um, there were some more around some of the same things around value added grants. Um, and if Lisa wants to take one of those, but if there's any questions specifically for um, the panelists, those haven't come in yet. Yeah, I can, I can answer that quickly. Um, for anyone that's interested in the value added producers grant, that's not through FSA, it's through an office called Rural Development, um, but it's a grant available to help farmers um, either create new value added products or expand to new mar markets with their value added products. Um, that grant's open right now. It, the deadline is May 16th. Um, we did a, a quick video on a Facebook Live about a couple weeks ago um, where I did an over, a longer overview of that program. So if you're curious about it, I, I check that out. Um, but my, and if, if you go to um, www.rafiusa.org, there's a banner along the top uh, with a button to watch that. Um, and then the other place to look would be your um, find your state VAPG contact. 
Um, so let me add this link in the chat. That's the main VAPG um, page. If you go in there and select your specific state um, and then go to um, contact, it will list the person to contact. So every state has a VAPG person within rural development. Their job is to help farmers put together applications um, and, and to help them craft competitive um, applications. So if you're serious about applying, I would definitely, um, you know, reach out to that person, review some of the, the documents that are also on that website. Um, that's kind of your starting point. Um, I saw another question a little further up about um, kind of receiving uh, receipts for service retroactively. Um, and that's one that I would want to, I would want to ask about that. I don't know that for sure. Um, you know, I, I know that FSA will you know, keep kind of your file. Um, everyone has a file of information that includes like, you know, the documents that you have submitted. What I don't know is if that file also includes like emails and, and summaries of phone conversations. Um, but I, I can follow up on that and, and get that answer unless um, either Shardell or Anita are aware of that. That I'm not aware of, but I, like I said, I do memorandums for, for record and I usually email that person to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what the requirements were at that time and who committed to do what and what my understanding of our conversation was. So, you know, even with that, yeah, especially if you don't have a receipt for service, you can always email and say on this day, I spoke to this person about this subject and we discussed these things at that time, this person committed to do X, Y, and Z, and I provided these documents and um, you know, summarize the event. Great. Um, someone asked about the North Carolina contact. I'll put that in the chat and then we can also put the website um, in the chat. And maybe just, um, I was looking at that North Carolina question, if either panelists have tips, how do you know who, um, who to get in touch with? Um, which person did you like contact in your office? Like if you're not getting a response from someone? Well, in our instance, if I'm not getting a response from my local office, then I know my state office is in Richmond and I always have their information and I can contact their supervisor in that office and let them know the situation. And, you know, if you go online, their email contacts are there and I could always, you know, share that information, my, my memos of, of record, my, you know, memorandums of understanding of our conversations you know, those kinds of things to help build your case about non-support. And then, you know, if you want to add a little fire <laughs> to that conversation, you can always CC your congressional representatives at the same time. And I bet you, you'll get a response within a week. So I know for me, I've called the office and if I can't get the person who I am looking for, I'll call the main number and say, who else is in the office I can speak to? And do they have access to my file? And then if they, if I don't get a response there, then I would follow what has just been shared going to the state office. But I typically ask for a supervisor um, if I can't get the person who I've been talking to. I've not necessarily had that problem where I had to do that, but that seems like the um, prudent thing that is doable. I do have a question though, as a new farmer, and someone mentioned the county um, office of record where your paperwork is. Can you all shed some light on whether or not that changes or can you keep it the same? Because my understanding is I've delegated 
uh, a particular county to be my county record of office. And it doesn't matter anywhere else in the state where I can go and farm, all of my records are going to be with that county office. Is that accurate? that's another one where I'd, I'd want to do a little extra research to give a definite number or a definite answer. Um, I do know for like particular programs, um, you still need to work with whatever office, county office, where like an event occurred. Like if you had NAP crop insurance and had a crop failure that was in a different county from your kind of your central one, you would still need to work with that office. Um, in order to, to access that program. But any sort of interaction that you're having with FSA is still going to be kind of kept in, you know, the cloud of, of, of your account and, and your interactions um, and should be accessible to, you know, between offices as well, I would imagine. But I can, I can look more into that. Thank I would you. also That's check helpful. on um, farmers.gov. There's a portal where some of your documents are kept. So you should create an account on farmers.gov and, and see if those documents are there. So I asked that question because when I was trying to process the application for the farm ownership loan, the office in question uh, where the property was located initially did not take it. And so I sent it to the office where they seemed to be more open and had a different understanding of what that process was. And then I made them my home record of office. Did I say that right? The office where the land was kept. That was the recording county. That's what they're called. It's the recording office for all of your records. And then they sent the application to where the, the county where the land was. And that's how I was able to get the process started. Any other questions from... Um people on the call, either in chat or um, off of mute. It looks like we have a question from Carrie. Um, for the panel, what are your suggestions um, for me since I'm currently stuck renting my home and gardening in the backyard? Um, can I still qualify and get started um, somewhere with FSA, et cetera? I would say you, you could because just like Shardell just shared, she started her hemp operation in her backyard. So I would make that appointment with FSA to get your farm number because that's where the magic happens. You've got to have a registered farm location in order to receive services. Okay, sounds good. And I, I concur with that. Um, contacting your, your local office and asking them to come out um, and do what is necessary. There's be some paperwork that would have to be filed in order for that file, that farm number to be issued. But that's, that's the way I started. Um, but it was, my start was, I was actually, actually trying to file the acreage report. And then they came back and they said, well, here are the documents you need to complete and that was what started the farm number um, issuance. But there's also, even if you're in an urban backyard, urban setting, there's so much work that's being done to support farmers um, in urban communities, right? So expanding the farming industry out of rural areas and into urban areas. And so regardless to whether you're rural or urban, they should um, be open to supporting that. Okay. And I'm actually wanting, interested in moving into like a different county. So that's our another, like another layer of, I don't know, you know, how that's going to work with us qualifying because I'm in a rental right now, but we actually want to re relocate to a different county. So I guess just count, contact that county that we're interested in moving in. 
That's what I would do wherever you're gonna have your farming operation and make sure you ask them what documents you need. I have a little brochure that tells me that you need to have proof of identity such as a driver's license, so security card, IRS number. You gotta have proof of ownership of your farming location, a copy of a deed or leases, and then a, a copy of something that identifies whether you're going to farm as a sole proprietor. If you're going to be an LLC, then you're going to need like things like the articles of incorporation, um, any trust or deed documents, or a partnership agreement. So you know, come prepared so that you don't you aren't running back and forth. Um, to get the process resolved. And a quick question on that. I do actually have a business and I was wondering, can I do a DBA like doing business as my, can that be the farm or should I just open up a whole nother LLC? That question, I would um, ask your small business <laughs> development center. I'm not, you know, no. don't want to give you any legal advice. I'm not an attorney, but yeah. um, there should be a small business development center advisor that you can turn to, to help you with, with that kind of um, technical issue. All right, appreciate it, yeah. Great, uh, if there are no other questions, I think we will wrap up with a, a couple things. Um, First, I wanted to kind of summarize ways that um, Rafi is going to follow up and can help um, for all, for everyone that's attending today and for anyone that registered, we'll be sending out a link to the webinar recording. Um, we can also share a PDF of the slides if you didn't get everything um, written down that you wanted to. Um, we also will send an email to complete a webinar evaluation. Um, let me also just put it in the chat right now. <laughs> It's really helpful to get feedback on the webinars to know what sort of information um, is useful if it, you know, inspires you to, to take action or if there's things you'd like to see in future, in future events. Um, so if you have a few minutes, please uh, go ahead and fill that out. Um, other ways that Rafi can help, like I mentioned at the top of the call, um, we are available for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance around, broadly around FSA issues. So even if it's just like, um, you know, starting out, if you have a particular question about um, NAP or things like that, we're available um, through email, phone, or that intake form, and I have some of that contact information at the bottom of that screen. Um, on our website, we have some program flyers, past webinar recordings, and we hope to do more webinars coming up. Um, and we are also hoping to start offering some FSA, spe FSA loan-specific technical assistance later this year and we'll be um, posting a job position for that soon. So if anyone on this call um, is either interested or knows someone that might be interested, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I'll also mention that we have a webinar coming up at the end of the month around um, GAP certification and organic certification as part of our market readiness series. So if anyone would be interested in learning more about that, um, they can go on our website to register and I'll try to throw that in the link, uh, that link into the chat right now. Um, I believe that's it. I just want to give um, appreciation again for Shardella and Anita for sharing uh, this evening and, um, and for everyone that's attended. Please reach out if there's additional questions. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you so much.